Welcome to Self Talk Show, where we bring you inspiring stories and insights from leaders who are making a difference. I'm your host Mitali, and today we have a truly remarkable guest with us, Pablo Munoz, the managing director of Munoz and Company. Pablo has a wealth of experience, spending 30 years in education, including a remarkable 16 years as a superintendent of schools. He has been recognized left and right, from being the 2008 County School Superintendent of the Year to earning a spot in the George Lucas Educational Foundation's 2008 Daring Dozen, a group of educators shaping the future of education. Pablo is also a leadership coach, teacher, trainer, speaker, and the brains behind the Leaders Algorithm. Pablo, welcome to Self Talk Show. Mitali, thank you for having me as your guest. I'm really excited to be on your show. Well, it's a pleasure having you on my podcast. So, without further ado, let's begin your interview. Can you share more about your personal journey from being a first-generation high school graduate to becoming the managing director of Munoz and Company? How did your experiences shape your approach to education and leadership? So. I was born, raised, and educated in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And for your listeners across the world, Elizabeth is located approximately 16 miles southwest of New York City. And for those who have flown into North Liberty International Airport, that airport actually sits. On Elizabeth soil. Today, I live in a town called Maplewood, New Jersey, for the last 26 years. My parents, Pablo and Luz, immigrated to New Jersey from Aguada, Puerto Rico, and my dad has an eighth-grade education, and my mom has a sixth-grade education. And my dad, for the most part, did his work in restaurants. He started out washing dishes, and then someone saw it promise in him and taught him how to cook. And he spent most of his career working in banquet halls, serving thousands of guests breakfast, lunch, or dinner. My mom, she started working in factories. In plastic factories, and eventually she transitioned to being a seamstress. I lived in a house with my maternal grandmother Cecilia, and my mom and dad, uh, my sister Doris, uh, Tia Lidia, and my three cousins Carlos, Johnny, and Ivan, and uh, my father's one or fifteen. And my mom is one of five, so I have a whole lot of cousins. And uh, recently, my mom and dad were actually doing a count, and uh, I think we we counted seventy first cousins. So, by the nature of having such a large family and many cousins, my circle of, of friends was largely uh, my family and my cousins. We would go over to their houses regularly and、uh, go to the park together. I went to Elizabeth High School, and I played baseball for most of my life. I got my undergraduate degree at Yale University in psychology, and while I was there, I entered the teacher preparation program. So、uh, I student taught in New Haven, Connecticut. At Wilbur Cross High School, and I also volunteered as a baseball coach, and、uh, and that's also another part of my life, and actually taught me a lot of lessons, you know, leadership lessons. I was a、uh, baseball coach、uh, as a teacher, and when I was administrator, and I've coached at all levels. So I've coached from little league, where I coached my daughters, and all the way up to professional. Where I was a minor league pitching coach for the Chicago Cubs, 
My master's degree is from Teachers College, Columbia University. So I began my teaching career back home in the Elizabeth Public Schools as a teacher of social studies. I would eventually get promoted to supervisor of social studies, then the director of curriculum instruction, then promoted again to assistant superintendent. And then finally in 2005, I became the superintendent of schools for the Elizabeth Public Schools. I did that for about eight and a half years. And in 2013, I became superintendent of the Passaic Public Schools. Both school districts are, are both inner city school districts in New Jersey. Both of them are two of the largest school districts in New Jersey. And I was superintendent of Passaic for about seven and a half years. And then I retired, but immediately established my educational and leadership consulting company called Munoz and Company. I'm an adjunct professor at Lehigh University in the Educational Leadership Department, and I'm also now an author of a book called The Leader's Algorithm. And I'll end this section by telling you what I'm most proud of. And what I'm most proud of are my two daughters, Cecilia, who is 22, and she graduated from MIT in June 2023. And currently she works at the Boston Consulting Group. And in, interesting enough, uh, I just recently, back in September, moved her into her apartment in Boston. But soon thereafter, her first work assignment was in New York. So it was, it, it was actually too funny that she was living in Boston, but she was basically back home uh, near our house working in New York City. And then my youngest daughter, Sadie, who's 19, she's currently a first year at Northeastern University. And her first year actually is in uh, full first year in London. And, uh, and then when she becomes a sophomore, she'll return to the Boston campus. So that's my personal journey. That's where I come from, where I've been, it's what I've done and where I am today. That's an exceptionally inspiring story of yours. Thank you for sharing. Your book, The Leader's Algorithm, explores the concept of making systematic changes to address entrenched issues. Could you provide a brief overview or gist of the key principles outlined in Leader's Algorithm and how it serves as a strategic framework for transformation? Sure. So, the Leader's Algorithm is a book at its basic level. It's a book on educational leadership. Why did I write The Leader's Algorithm? And the answer to that, if I had to use one word, is help. I wrote The Leader's Algorithm to help aspiring, new, and current school administrators. And my vision for the book is to share what I learned from my 30-year journey in public education, 16 years as superintendent of schools. I also wanted to share what I learned from my advocates and mentors, what I learned from the Broad Academy, and what I learned from what I call my book mentors. All the books, and case studies I read about leadership, management, teaching, and learning by authors that I mostly never met. In addition, my hope is that aspiring new and current school administrators will buy the book, will read it, and use it to create a leadership framework and strategy to lead and manage their schools and school districts. So that's the title of the book, The Leader's Algorithm. But The Leader's Algorithm, when you find yourself in chapter one, is also a simple equation that puts strategic thinking to work. You write and share your personal theory of action. Then, 
You don't leave it as a theory. You actually execute your personal theory of action consistently with public accountability. And if you do this, then you will transform your life, work, schools, school districts, and relationships. Said another way, personal theory of action plus execution plus accountability equals transformation. So I use the book, The Leader's Algorithm, to teach a lot of leadership principles. And I do that by sharing personal and professional stories that amplify those leadership principles. But the heart and soul of the book is the personal theory of action. And when you read chapter one, I teach you what a personal theory of action is. I don't leave it in the abstract. And then I also use chapter one to help you write your own personal theory of action. So what is a personal theory of action? It's a written leadership framework. A personal theory of action is what you can do personally and through your team to achieve your goals. It is written as a logical chain of if-then statements that lead to your ultimate goal. Said another way, if we do A, B, and C, then we will get X, Y, and Z results. My personal theory of action was the leadership framework and strategy I used to lead and manage the Elizabeth and Passaic public school systems. The personal theories of action that I wrote for Elizabeth and Passaic, my final two versions for those two school districts are in Appendix A. But I kind of give you a flavor of what the structure of my personal theory of action is, and when you pick up the book, you can actually read it in its entirety. My personal theory of action leads with four if statements. The first one has to do with what I can personally do and focus on. The second if statement has to do with how I select leaders and what I expect from those leaders. The third if statement defines how I will go about redesigning the school district. And the fourth if statement are the guiding principles for the school district. And then it ends with the then statement. And usually your then statement is your mission statement or you're paraphrasing your mission statement. I find your personal theories of action to be deeply insightful and helpful. Undoubtedly, this will assist future leaders in crafting and formulating their own theories of action. I encourage our listeners to visit Amazon and purchase Pablo's incredible book, The Leader's Algorithm. As someone with 30 years of experience in education, including 16 years as a superintendent, what do you believe are the essential qualities of a transformative leader, especially in the context of educational leadership? So what are the the essential qualities of a transformative leader or what you should expect from a transformative leader? What I'm going to share with you, I largely learned from my mom and dad. Then I'll share some qualities that I learned along the way while I was a superintendent of schools. So my parents taught me five important lessons or five essential qualities of a leader. The first one is commitment. The second one is high standards. The third is faith. And by faith, I mean Faith in my family, faith in my friends, faith in my team and my staff, 
faith in my students, faith in my God, but also, ultimately, faith in myself. And the fourth is loyalty. And I illustrate this particular characteristic in my book uh, through this story, through this following story. And what I should have led with is that many of these lessons, because my mother and father were fairly quiet and reserved people, many of these lessons I learned by watching them and listening to them. But back to loyalty. And the story has to do with baseball, which is, quite frankly, a running theme through my life. Uh, there was a, a time when I was playing Little League and I was playing for the St. Joseph Little League All-Star team. And that was the only league that would take me, actually. And there's a whole story about that in the book. But in this particular case, with regard to loyalty, I was also playing on a another team in another league. St. Joseph's was in a town called Roselle, and I was playing for the little Cubanitos in Elizabeth. And uh, both teams had selected me to be on their all-star team, and they actually were going to end up at the same tournament. So I had to choose uh, which team I was going to play on. And obviously choosing the Elizabeth team would have been the easiest decision to to, to make because it was my hometown and it's literally uh, around the corner. But like I said earlier, uh, the longer story I won't share right now, but uh, at the time, uh, St. Joseph was the only Little League that would accept me and my cousin Carlos. And we played there for many years. So now we have to make this decision. And just watching my parents, I knew the answer was loyalty. Play with St. Joseph's in that tournament, even though Elizabeth was my hometown, because when no one else would take me to play Little League, St. Joseph did. So I needed to show them the loyalty that they showed me through the years and play on their all-star team. The fifth essential quality is humility. And quite frankly, there's often very little of that in all different arenas of leadership. And this one I learned largely from my dad. And the story I tell in the book is about how my dad would work long hours at the restaurant. And during baseball season, if I had a game the next day and it rained through the night, my dad wanted me to get the game in. And because when he was a young uh, boy, he grew up on a farm, he realized he needed to get over to the field early in the day and rake the field and and, and allow for the sun to dry out the field for a game that probably started around five or six o'clock in the evening. And uh, he would do that after a long day of work. And then he would go down the field, rake the field, and eventually go to work. And <laughs> by the end of the day, heading into the baseball game, essentially, you know, 30 little leaguers, two teams would, would get their game in because miraculously the field was dry and ready to play. And uh, my dad never sought credit for it. He just knew it was important to the boys that were playing and, and to his son. And that was a, a running theme through my dad. He, he certainly would be very happy and brag about his children and now his grandchildren and now his great-grandchildren, but never about himself, always about others and always out there to help. So I think humility is a very important and essential quality for a leader. So um, if I was following a leader, I would be looking for uh, these five things, commitment, high standards, faith, loyalty, and humility. But I think the biggest lesson I learned from my parents was not anything they actually said to me. And like I said earlier, they were fairly quiet and reserved. So what I'm about to say, I actually, it wasn't something they said to me. It's something that I observe. I've I actually put words to it and included it in the book. And the biggest lesson that I learned from them, and I think it's an important characteristic or quality of a transformative leader, is the following. Listen 
and learn with your eyes and your heart more than with your ears. And I always thought that was a very powerful example that they gave me by modeling that for me. And ultimately, I would adopt it as one of my characteristics. And it speaks to the importance of of actions and deeds and follow through. And especially when you're a leader, you know, when, when you have to make decisions and judge programs and people, it's important to to be able to look, listen, learn, and and make decisions based on what you see, what your heart tells you, and what your gut tells you. And I will leave you with qualities that I used when I selected leaders and when I coached and mentored my team members, my my leaders on my team. Uh, I always looked for two major characteristics, teaching and leading. So I always looked for someone who was going to become an administrator and hopefully would become an effective leader to see if they could teach, right? Were they good teachers of students? And when they become administrators, will they be good teachers of their staff? And then the second characteristic would be leading. Will people follow them? And will they eventually be effective leaders and be able to inspire their team to achieve excellent results. Pablo, you have not only enlightened us with the qualities of a transformative leader, but also taught us that real learning doesn't only come from the workplace, but from our personal lives as well. The lessons you have imbibed from your parents are so powerful that everyone should absorb them. In addition to your role at Munoz & Company, you're a leadership coach, teacher and adjunct professor. How do you approach coaching and teaching to instill leadership principles? And what do you find most rewarding about these roles? Well, I'll begin with the second part of your question, what, what I find most rewarding about these roles. Whether I'm a leadership coach or an adjunct professor or a teacher or a mentor, what I always found rewarding, whether I was a high school teacher or now in my current role as a leadership coach and an adjunct professor, is seeing your students grow. And uh, I'll talk in a second about the three particular roles that I'm, I'm living now in helping future leaders. But a large part of it is kind of sitting back and, and listening to the, the student or the client explain what they're going through and helping them think through their, their problems. And there's always a fine line with helping them struggle with it and come up with a solution and, and you helping them by guiding them and giving them advice. So what's most rewarding is seeing them succeed and that's ultimately it, as adults if they're succeeding hopefully what they're doing back in their schools are helping improve the lives of students so being an adjunct professor or, or a mentor or a coach I have a lot of things in similarity right um, you either have a student or a client on the other side and, and you're doing a lot of teaching and, and, and using different methods to help students or clients comprehend the content and have them think about how they'll, they'll apply it. But I'll tackle each role and, and let you know how I approach it. So I'll start with the adjunct professor work that I do at Lehigh. I teach three different classes right now. One is called Leading and Managing Change, which I, I love teaching. The other one is called School District Resource Management, which is kind of school finance from the perspective of the superintendent. And uh, now this spring term, I'll be teaching a course called Diversity and Multicultural Perspectives, which is very exciting, especially in these times, to, to, to see what, 
what students learn and, and what they have to say about those concepts. But um, when I'm teaching my leadership classes, and quite frankly, in the class that I'm going to teach now in the spring on diversity, I always tell the students the following. A leader must continue to teach. A leader must be the chief learner and the chief teacher of the organization. So that's the fundamental premise that I use when I design the, the course and then when I design my individual lesson plans for, for the term is that that's kind of the running theme throughout the course. And one of the best ways for someone to learn is for them to actually teach. So many of the assignments that I give the students are text-based, right? So they read some content, and depending on the course, it could be three books and, and six case studies, multiple books, and uh, in this term, we'll be doing some film case studies. Um, but, in, but regardless of what, how the content is delivered, I require them to teach that content to someone and have a conversation with them about what they taught, how they taught it, what the, um, the person they were teaching, what they learned and took from it. And then I asked them about how they're going to apply this content to their personal and professional lives or, or, or to both. And um, I think that goes a long way for them to kind of internalize the content, but in the act of teaching it to someone else, they, they get to learn it. They get it to learn it better. And then my classes are largely discussion-based and, and everyone gets to kind of share their perspective on on the content that they're learning and, and debate it and, and find similarities or differences in, in their responses. The mentoring work that I do is, is, is more prescriptive. I work with the local state superintendents association and that mentoring work largely is prescribed through that program and the New Jersey Department of Education. It ends up being about a 12-month experience, and the client has to create a, a plan with goals and activities. And I, I spend the year helping the client go through their plan and executing it and then uh, creating artifacts because ultimately once that engagement ends after 12 months, they have to apply f for a standard certificate in, in the field that they're working in. So being that it, it's pretty prescriptive, there's a bunch of categories that they have to work on and a bunch of standards. Uh, my, my role is to keep them on track and also my role as a mentor, even though the program is pretty prescribed, is really to answer a lot of the questions that they have because these people are our first year, uh, they're, this is their first year in, in the job that they're working in towards this particular certificate. And every day and every month brings up new challenges that, that they've never done before. And since, you know, I, I had 30 years of public school experience and 16 as a superintendent and a few other years as other level administrator, I've seen a lot of the, the issues and problems that they have to solve and I can kind of help them through it. Another element of it is, you know, to to actually get them to connect to a network outside of their organization. And so I help them identify some people that that can answer some questions for them in domains that they typically wouldn't uh, be working on. And the executive coaching work that I do through my company is interesting. It can take various can take various approaches. And in, in its purest sense, coaching would be that the, the client holds the agenda and the client identifies the, the goals they want to work on. And I um, meet with them uh, probably twice a month and, and push them towards uh, achieving the goals that they set out and questioning them and and having them create new goals as they accomplish goals. But what tends to happen is that it becomes a kind of a hybrid of 
of a pure coaching experience and mentoring. So even though we're setting goals and coaching, oftentimes they, they leverage me more for mentoring where they start to pick my brain about my experience and how, how I would handle something. And uh, so there's a fine line because coaching, really, you want the other person doing most of the talking, most of the exploring, most of the, the setting the goals and for me to challenge them with questions. But uh, it, it's a kind of a little dance that goes back and forth uh, between coaching and mentoring in those situations. Wow. A leader must continue to teach. A leader must be the chief learner and the chief teacher of the organization. What a brilliant fundamental premise that you use to design your course and practice it. In your book, you talk about developing a personal theory of action to transform organizations, work and relationships. How can leaders go about developing their own theory of action? And what role does it play in driving positive change? How can leaders go about developing their own personal theory of action? Well, the first thing they can do is pick up my book, The Leader's Algorithm. It's available on Amazon and at your favorite bookstores. And once you get the book, you'll dive into chapter one, because in chapter one, which is entitled Defining the Leader's Algorithm, I describe and teach what a personal theory of action is and then the second part of the chapter I walk you through developing your own personal theory of action I also have a, a template there that you can use to start drafting and making multiple drafts of your personal theory of action and uh, appendix A has my final two personal theories of action from the Elizabeth and Passaic public school systems as references, you can see how how I wrote them. And you can use some of the language or, or none of it, but it gives you an idea of how to create one. What role does it play in driving positive change? Quite frankly, I mean, I said this earlier, it was the leadership framework that I used to, to lead and manage my school districts. So I took the mental models that were in my head and and we all, as administrators and leaders, have some sense of values and beliefs and experiences that shape how one wants to lead. And given the amount of years that I spent in public education and uh, books and case studies and articles that I read, it really shaped my thinking. So you end up having these mental models and, they, and, and through trial and error, you kind of start to develop your own leadership style. But what's critically important, and it's critically important to the organization, is that you write it down and that you share it with the organization and the public. Don't keep it a secret. It's important for them to understand what you believe in and what actions you plan to take, what strategic actions you plan to take to help improve the school district. So. I won't read you the entire personal theory of action from Passaic, but let me deal with, with two of the pieces and give you a sense. One has to do with the three items that I focused in on. And then the second one has to do with kind of the, the organizational theory of action that was embedded in my personal theory of action. So my first if statement has to deal with what I personally did. And, uh, and it read like this. If I lead with a focus on three items, keep the system focused on its vision and mission with an effort to produce excellent results. Two, select effective leaders to carry out the mission. And three, get the resources into the classroom. Those were the, the three most important things that I believe that I should be doing at all times, right? Public education is full of noise and activities and, and you get pulled in many different directions. It's probably no different in any organization if you're the CEO or if you're the chief school administrator. Uh, but I was very clear and people could see that through my written word, my spoken word and my actions that I was laser-like focused on these three items. The second piece of my personal theory of action that I want to share with your audience 
has to do with the if statement that dealt with the organization. And and this was a, a two for one, it was in my personal theory of action and how I would be conducting myself in redesigning the school district. But at the same time, I had the school board adopt a board policy as a district theory of action. And the district theory of action and my personal theory of action, this particular element of it matched. So with the board adopting that policy, it gave me, the superintendent, strength and direction on how to redesign the school district. Now, I wrote the policy, and it was embedded in my personal theory of action, so it's exactly what I wanted to do. But now that I had the board owning it through a policy, it really helped me uh, able to, to work on those elements. And so I'll give you shorthand. Uh, there's seven pieces to this. I'll start with the, the opening clause, and then I'll just give you a shorthand of what the seven items were. If I move the district toward an aligned instructional system, and then I worked on seven items, one, curriculum, two, developing effective teachers and leaders, three, providing a comprehensive professional development system, four, formative and summative assessments, five, student information system, six, interventions for students, teachers, administrators, and schools, and number seven, measure performance, progress, and growth. In my personal theory of action, I was clear that I was going to work on those items, and the board had the policy that was much longer, right? My, my personal theory of action fits on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper on one side, whereas a policy was three to five pages long. So those elements were, were much more detailed. But the, the organization and all the staff knew that was what we were going to work on as a school district. And I would keep the district focused on those seven items, right? Now, and these things don't happen overnight, right? Eight and a half years in Elizabeth, seven and a half years in Passaic. It takes time and the work is ongoing. Uh, I'm no longer there. And, and hopefully the superintendent and the board and their staff continue every year to make progress on those elements of the theory of action. Now, I'm no longer there, so they can adopt a whole new, new different board policy and, and the superintendent may have uh, her own personal theory of action that differs from mine. But as a leader, it's, it's very important whether you're, if you're leading a Fortune 500 company or a school district or a school, that you're very clear about how you're going to approach your leadership. And as time goes along, I mean, you're flexible and, and the personal theory of action is not written in stone, right? It changes over time as you, as you learn more and try things and, and things don't work. And you have to change course and rewrite your personal theory of action. But having it written down and sharing it, from my experience, it makes it very clear to the organization where we're going and what we plan to do. That's amazing. Graduating from Yale University with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, an Ivy League pitching honors is an impressive academic and athletic achievement. How have your experiences at Yale shaped your leadership philosophy? And in what ways do you apply the lessons from your Ivy League education in your work? Yale shaped my leadership philosophy in two major ways. And it was really the, the totality of the experience that shaped it. One, being prepared. So I attended Yale, and as I, I was going through classes, I just, my school district had not prepared me well for the intensity of rigor that, that existed at Yale. And it took me some time to, to adjust to it, I ultimately did and graduated in four years. But that experience shaped my leadership profoundly in that when I told myself when I was the superintendent of schools and had broad 
leadership responsibility for the entire district as opposed to a teacher in one classroom or a supervisor or a director or even assistant superintendents where I have elements of the organization. When I became superintendent, I worked to design a school system that would prepare students to go on to college and I mean, ultimately they could decide if they wanted to go to college or not, but that their experience in our schools would have them prepared. And if they landed at Yale or any other school, that, that they would be able to succeed there and not feel like the elementary, secondary school system they came from had not done their job to prepare. So that was number one, that the school district that I was going to lead was going to make sure that we prepared our students to do well in college. And number two, by attending Yale, now I knew what rigor looked like. So I could go back as a teacher and then as a supervisor and as a director and then ultimately as the superintendent and ensure that when we were designing curriculum and buying instructional materials and then when we were supervising instruction and teachers were teaching the lessons and we were evaluating and giving them feedback, that we were going to require uh, rigorous, cognitively challenging academic tasks for the students to complete. So those, those were the two major things. One, making sure that students are prepared to go on to college and do well. And two, now that I knew what rigor looked like, that when we redesigned our school system curriculum, that the academic work that we asked our students to do was going to be rigorous. Well, I feel that by infusing the concept of rigor into the curriculum and instruction practices, you have opened the doors for the students to challenge themselves and arm up with the necessary skills and knowledge to succeed in college and beyond. Your book suggests that effective leadership is not only about systems management, but also an act of love. Can you share examples from your own experiences where leading from the heart has made a significant impact on the success of a school district? As superintendent of schools, I believed and I acted with the belief that I needed to love my students like I love my own children. And what I mean by that is universal love, being selfless, unconditional, compassionate, empathetic, and showing your students enduring love, commitment, patience, and tolerance. As I said earlier, I'm the father of, of two daughters, and I love them with all my heart, all my soul, and all my might. And you know, I would walk through fire for them. And as a superintendent, I approached my school district leadership and design as if my own two daughters were going to my school system. And therefore, if I believed and I was preparing my daughters to go on to college, I believed my students in my school district deserved the same opportunity. So I'll share an example. In Passaic, we had what we called an equity goal. And the equity goal was written that we would prepare students graduating from the Passaic Public Schools to earn a career certification, 15 college credits, or both. And we used that equity goal to design the school system from policies to programs to curriculum to scope and sequence to lesson plans to the instructional materials that we bought. We're all geared towards fulfilling that equity goal. And, and we also entered into agreement with local colleges to be able to offer our students college credits. But I had a larger vision, and I would share that vision with the high school principals in group meetings and then one-on-one -on -one meetings, that 
I wanted students not only to graduate high school with a high school diploma, but also with an associate's degree. And in 2021, one of our high schools in Passaic graduated about 12 or 13 seniors with a high school diploma and an associate's degree. And the following year in 2022, I think it doubled, more than doubled to, to about 30. Now, now, the funny thing is that I wasn't there when, when this happened because I retired in April of 2021 and the first group to graduate with an associate's degree graduated in June. So I, I wasn't fortunate enough to shake their hands, but I was very proud of them. They did the work. And, uh, and, that's how, and that's how you show love. I mean, there's an element of showing them compassion and love through social emotional learning and all the resources we put behind that. But we also show them love by, by challenging them academically and getting them prepared to go on to college. Pablo, your emphasis on the importance of showing universal love, compassion, empathy, and enduring commitment to students and staff truly makes you a true example of an educational leader. Being named one of the George Lucas Educational Foundation's steering dozen is a significant recognition. How has this experience influenced your approach to reshaping the future of education? And what lessons have you learned from working with this prestigious group? Being named one of George Lucas Educational Foundation's daring dozen was, uh, was a big surprise and uh, was a great honor. So it was really exciting uh, when that honor was bestowed on me. But the honor itself did not influence me in any major way. By being honored by the foundation, it introduced me to their magazine, Edutopia, which is uh, completely online now. And uh, it's a fabulous resource for school leaders and, and teachers. But the biggest lesson I learned from the George Lucas Educational Foundation actually came by way of being appointed onto their National Advisory Council. I got to go out to California, got to visit Skywalker Ranch. And uh, in my first visit there, we were having dinner and I had a conversation with their CFO and he started to tell me what made George Lucas as a movie maker different than other folks, right? So Star Wars came out and other people said, oh, that Star Wars was a big hit. Let's, let's create other movies like Star Wars uh, that take that took place in space. And many of those movies weren't very good. And what the CFO impressed upon me was that what made George Lucas so special was not necessarily the technology and being in space, but that he was such a great storyteller. So the biggest lesson that I, that I got from the George Lucas Education Foundation was that when I'm leading and managing school districts that I needed to remember that my students and my staff, they all have individual stories. And those individual stories will shape the culture of my school district. That is so true. Learning the importance of storytelling and applying it to your educational leadership is a significant and incredible step because it highlights and values the stories of your students, staff and leaders, creating a more inclusive and supportive environment. Your experience as a minor league pitching coach with the Chicago Cubs provides a unique perspective. What parallels do you draw between coaching in sports and coaching in educational leadership? Wow, this is a wonderful question. Uh, baseball whether playing or coaching has been has been an incredible part of my life. So I actually have a lot to say on this topic of coaching and sports and 
and coaching and educational leadership. So I'll answer this question in three ways. First, in the context of baseball, there were three people, three critical relationships in my life that transcended over to my school leadership. The first was with my mom. My mom, like I said earlier, very quiet woman, hardworking, very smart, only a sixth grade education, but incredibly smart. And when she spoke, she had a big impact on you. And uh, you better listen. Very strong woman. But in the context of baseball, what she modeled was she attended just about every baseball game, was in the stands supporting her son, supporting her nephew. And, uh, and that was a lesson that, that I carried on when my own daughters were playing soccer, attending all their games, being there on the sideline, showing them support. And so mom modeled that. Now, it was easier in Little League because she had to drive us there. High school became a little more difficult because some games were farther away in the state of New Jersey and made it difficult for her to travel. And certainly when they played college baseball at Yale, it became even more difficult, the away games. The home games being in New Haven, Connecticut, was a you know about a two-hour drive for her from New Jersey, so she was able to attend many of the home games, but we could play games in the state of Connecticut or anywhere in the United States, and obviously those games were harder to, to get to. And uh, unlike today, where I can see my daughter's college games online, that, that didn't exist back when I played baseball. So mom... Being at all the games was incredibly important for me. The second was my relationship with my father and the game of baseball. So my dad was my first teacher when it came to baseball. Had a ball in my hands, at least from the photo albums. I mean, conversations with my dad as early as I could hold on to the ball. And uh, he loved the game. Uh, and he practiced with me and my cousins and my sister all the time, or relatively all the time, because he was working a lot. But when he wasn't working, we were on the field practicing. I actually, as I sit here and it's almost below zero outside, I still remember going out in the cold weather, getting prepared for the spring, uh, but it was the winter, and we were outside throwing the ball, getting ready to play Little League. So Dad had a big impact on me when it came to baseball in that he taught me the game and to have a passion for it. And now that we are uh, both older, uh, I'm in my 50s and my dad's in the 70s, we, we get to go watch games together at home on TV and, and at the stadiums. So that relationship and that bond that I had my, with my dad, uh, even though he was working most of the time, was incredibly powerful. And I like to think I have that bond with my daughters, uh, although it's a different sport, soccer. So the third relationship was with my high school baseball coach, Coach Ray Korn. Uh, goes down in history as one of the best high school baseball coaches of all time. He, it's in the High School Baseball Coaches Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, by the time I got to high school and I played three seasons with him as a sophomore, junior, senior, I learned a lot about the game of baseball and strategy and tactics and, and preparing for games. And, and that was as a player. But then when I became a teacher and was on his staff as a coach, I continued to learn how, at this point, how to be a coach, and how, to, how to study and read books and watch videos and go to clinics and learn all the other positions that I didn't play that I had to teach. So those three people in the context of baseball had an incredible impact on me in the game of baseball, but also in the future when I became an educational leader. Well, a lot of what I do was as a result of the relationships I had with mom, dad, and coach Corn, The second thing 
actually the second and the third thing. The second thing, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that I learned as a player that affected me as an educational leader. And then the third thing will be a couple of things that I learned from coaching that, that I applied to educational leadership. So the second thing, when it came to playing, these were some of the lessons that were critically important that you would see later on in my educational leadership. The first was that you need an excellent head coach who can teach the game, break the game down into smaller units, and could build relationships with each player to determine how to motivate each player individually and how to motivate the team as a whole. The second thing that I learned <laughs> was that the newspaper headlines and the newspaper articles don't always tell the, the complete story. And, uh, and I learned that painfully in educational leadership as a superintendent of schools, but as an athlete, I also learned that one famous story that uh, was an article my sophomore year, I ended up pitching in the state semifinals that uh, eventually we won that game and we moved on to the finals, but I was a starting pitcher. I pitched all the innings and I ended up getting the headlines. And quite frankly, I didn't really pitch that well. Uh, and the reason we won was because of a team effort. But <laughs> if you read the story, uh, it was like a you know, Pablo Munoz show and it was really the, the Elizabeth Minman, the whole team is what really won that game. The third thing is that, that talent matters. And so how that crossed over to educational leadership was that it was critically important that I found and developed the, the best teachers and the best administrators possible. The fourth thing from playing the game of baseball that transcended over to educational leadership is that the game is won before you play the game. You need to practice year-round. You need to practice when no one is looking. You need to practice your individual responsibilities and your team responsibilities. And you need to practice when your opponents are not. Fifth thing was teamwork. And when I became a superintendent, and, and this is probably true for a lot of organizations, and especially in education where a classroom teacher can kind of close her door and run her own show or principal has their own building among many other buildings and can run their building with limited supervision from the central office, that I learned quickly that I had to figure out ways as the superintendent to create teamwork and break down silos across the district. And that I learned from baseball because... You know, championships are won by teams, especially in the game of baseball. The sixth thing that I learned from being a player in baseball is that you need to learn from watching your opponents. The seventh thing is, if you want to be a championship team, you have to play against the best, the most challenging competition. And how that translates to educational leadership is the theme that I have in a bunch of the questions that I answered earlier in the best way to improve academic performance and love your students and, and give them a chance to improve their lives and live the American dream is to, to provide them cognitively challenging academic tasks. And the eighth thing that I learned from being a player, a baseball player, was about the team off the field, the after hours, the, the friendships that I build with my teammates on and off the field, how we had each other's back, that we needed to trust each other, and that trust is the foundation for leading. Now, the third thing comes from the domain of coaching, and there are four major lessons that I learned from coaching that that made their way into my educational leadership. One, the leader is always the chief teacher and the chief coach. 
Two, I had to build systems. But I also had to break down large tasks into smaller tasks and then build it back up into larger systems. Three, players will follow you if they trust you and if they know you care about them. And the last lesson from coaching is number four. Players will follow you if you know the game, if you know how to teach the game, and if you know how to help them improve their skills and win games. I completely agree. Teamwork is not only a significant lesson for achieving success, but also for bringing about positive change. For those aspiring to make a positive impact in educational leadership, what advice would you offer based on your journey and the insights shared in your book? I would give two pieces of advice to those aspiring to make a positive impact on educational leadership. The first piece of advice would be to live the guiding principles of the leader's algorithm. And those guiding principles are, one, excellent leadership requires intentionality, execution, and accountability. Two, leading with vision requires bold action. Three, leading with high expectations elevates everyone. Four, leading with teamwork means relying on your whole team to reach your goals. Five, leading with skills requires ongoing rigorous development for everyone, especially the leader. Six, leading in your community means cultivating trusting relationships with all the stakeholders. Seven, leading with resilience requires support, boundaries, and a balanced life. And finally, number eight, leading with love means reminding people of who they are so that they can become the best versions of themselves. So if you aspire to make a positive impact in educational leadership, if you live these guiding principles, I think you'll be on a good road to success and becoming effective in your role as a school leader. The second piece of advice actually comes from my time as a superintendent of schools. I had many teachers ask me how they could grow into their first administrative role, which is usually either a supervisor or vice principal job. And I would tell them three things. First, excel in your current role. Next, prepare well for the interview. And finally, I'd give them the advice of John Maxwell, one of my book mentors, and also from Acts 20.35, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. So in the teaching context, that means looking for ways to volunteer, for more responsibility, even if it's unpaid, find groups or projects where you can step up and practice your leadership skills. Will a group follow you if you have no formal authority over them? That's your goal. When administrators see you giving of yourself and improving those skills and growing, they're more likely to recommend you for future opportunities. I also had principals and administrators ask my advice on how to advance their careers. They wanted to know everything they would need to do in order to become a director, an assistant superintendent, or even a superintendent of schools. And my answer was always the same. The best thing you can do is to excel in your current job. So if you aspire to make a positive impact in educational leadership, I think if you follow those two pieces of advice, I think you'll be on the right road to being successful and effective. These were really valuable pieces of advice that you just shared. I'm sure they will help our aspiring educational leaders to the core. As someone with a Puerto Rican background, 
How has your culture influenced your approach to education, leadership, and community engagement? So this this is really an interesting question. I think it's important first for your audience to know, and most likely they know, but I want to make sure I, I amplify it here that the background or the identity group of Puerto Rican is quite diverse. It's not monolithic. There's a lot of variety and diversity and history in someone with a Puerto Rican background. So I think that's important that we don't use too broad a brush and say that if you're Puerto Rican that you're going to be able to say that this particular culture makes you operate in a certain way. But I understand the fundamental premise of your question. And so it, it's really about my background and, and how that particular background and in culture influenced my approach to educational leadership and community. So before I dive into the answer, I, I need to make sure your audience understands. And I think if they reflect back on, on the opening comments that I made in, in my personal journey, they have a sense that, you know, I was born in New Jersey, so... Generally, if someone were to ask me you know, who I am, as far as a nationality, I would say I'm American, born in the United States. But, you know, my name, Pablo Munoz, quickly results in someone asking the follow-up question. And uh, so, yeah, I would, I would identify as being Puerto Rican. And then, you know, if I had to check a box on a census or a survey... I would check the box for Latino or Hispanic. But my background and culture really is a mix of my Puerto Rican heritage because I can trace that back to the 1700s in Puerto Rico. And being an American, being raised Roman Catholic, and mixing that all together, right? Growing up in the inner city and then going off to two Ivy League schools with most of my students, uh, my peers being from wealthier suburban private schools. So all those experiences kind of influenced my culture. But in particular, the Puerto Rican piece played out in four ways and how my Puerto Rican culture influenced my approach to education and leadership. So these are the four things that I would say. One, the importance of family. Family is kind of the beginning and end for me. I, I am so tied into my family, a few generations back, cousins and my current family, uh, my daughters, and, and hopefully in the future, their families. And the importance of family kind of translated itself into the school districts, as I saw the school districts as an extension of my families, and I wanted the best for my students and my staff. The second thing is that in the context of the schools that I ran and the students I was educating, I really saw myself in them. Many of their parents uh, were like my parents, uh, new immigrants to, to this country, and uh, those students were like me, and kind of the first one really to to go to school, public school, continuously and graduate from high school. Third thing I would say, and I kind of just started to say it, is that uh, in my staff, especially the bilingual department staff or, or the support staff like uh, food service workers and transportation workers and custodians and uh, administrative assistants, I would see my parents in them and I can also see my parents in my students' parents. So that would be the third thing from my Puerto Rican background that I would say impacted me as an educational leader. And, and finally, the fourth thing is kind of premised on the concept of new immigrants and English language learners and, and poverty that all came from my initial history 
of being a Puerto Rican, I think I said earlier, right, I'm two generations removed from grandparents who couldn't read or write in their native language of Spanish. So I see that uh, public education is an incredible instrument to improving the lives of children and allowing our students to fulfill their goals, to pursue happiness, and to live the American dream. Pablo, it's interesting how Puerto Rican and Indian cultures seem to have common ground, especially when it comes to values like family and education. Your experiences make us feel a connection, and we can totally relate to the beauty and diversity of Puerto Rican culture. Looking ahead, what kind of impact do you envision leaving? What are your future plans in terms of contributing to positive change, be it within the educational field or beyond? Okay. Well, this is a wonderful question to end on. I'm going to first start with the second part of your question, the future plans, and then I'll end my remarks with the first part of your question, kind of impact I envision leaving. So as for my future plans, I plan to continue to do what I'm currently doing, which is operating my Munoz and Company consulting organization, where I will provide executive coaching and mentoring. I also provide leadership training in the form of seminars and masterminds. I plan to continue to teach the future leaders of public education at the college level as an adjunct professor. And then I'm going to continue to be an author. Hopefully, I'll write a few more books. But in the meantime, I'll continue to talk about the leader's algorithm as a speaker and to also help folks um, who wish to write their own personal theories of action. And, uh, I'd love to help them generate that. I also have a seminar dedicated to the leader's algorithm, so I'm able also to provide that to any person or school district that would wish to kind of go through the leader's algorithm process. As to your first part of the question, the impact I envision leaving, I have two things I'll, I'll say on that. First, the way I envision living my life from now into the future is documented in the book, The Leader's Algorithm, in the chapter eight, Leading with Love, where I drafted a very personal theory of action that is guiding my life as I move forward. So let me share that with your audience so they can see how I took a personal theory of action and not applied it to work, but applied it to my personal life, and I called it a very personal theory of action. So it goes like this. If I focus on these five actions, one, live with purpose and intentionality, two, tell the truth and do not fear the results of that truth, three, conduct myself with patience, kindness, generosity, loyalty, and self-discipline. Four, work hard to grow my knowledge and understanding. And five, use my talents for the greater good. Then I move now to the second if statement, which is if I move towards this objective, which is to make those closest to me secure, happy, and proud in our loving relationship, and to teach, serve, give, and comfort others. And now the guiding principles. If I commit to these five guiding principles, one, care about others, two, be honest, three, love my family, four, respect humanity, and five, be humble, then, here's the ultimate goal for my life moving forward, then I will live a life 
of significance, success, and joy. So that's my very personal theory of action that kind of outlines for you how I'm going to be approaching my life moving forward. But let me conclude my comments with the concept of the legacy. And as I reach the end of my superintendent tenures at Elizabeth and Passaic, and particularly now that I'm an educational and leadership consultant, I want to emphasize that legacy is not about awards or recognition. At the end of the day, the most important question is, what have you done to improve the lives of children? And for me, knowing that the improvements my team and I made have deep roots that will persist is the heart of my professional legacy. And in my personal life, the way I led, taught, and influenced my daughters is the legacy I cherish most. That my life will live on after I'm gone in the lives of these children. Pablo, your personal journey and leadership lessons are truly inspiring for those in the field of education. Embracing values such as family, empathy and recognizing the transformative power of education can empower everyone to contribute to positive change and help students reach their full potential. Let's aspire to build a more inclusive and equitable education system, empowering every child to pursue their dreams and live a life filled with significance, success and joy. Mitali, thank you for the conversation and for allowing me to share my stories, my personal journey, and my leadership lessons. Thank you so much, Pablo. It was a huge honor to have you on my podcast. Well, that wraps it up for today's episode with Pablo Munoz. What an insightful conversation. Pablo, thank you for being here and sharing your journey and wisdom with us. Now, to all our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed today's discussion. Until next time on Self Talk Show, take care.